Okay, I think we can get started. Um, before we start, just a couple of quick things. Um, homework is due today, uh, and there will be a new homework posted probably tomorrow. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Uh, another thing that I discovered uh, while I was playing around with our models for this lecture was that the models don't have uh, flicker noise in them. So we'll have to release a new version of the models that include flicker noise. Uh, otherwise, life would be too good uh, with, with the current models. Uh, some other people have pointed out some other kind of funny things about the model. Um, one thing that, that is odd, and I haven't had a chance to look into it, is if you plot uh, the VTH from the model, right, if you go into, let's say, Spectre, and you say plot threshold voltage versus, let's say, channel length, you get a certain profile, right? You get actually reverse short channel effects. And, uh, you know, traditional short channel effects, you would expect as you make the channel length lower and lower, it's easier to invert the, uh, the, the channel. And so you would expect the threshold voltage to drop, not to go up. So if we plot the threshold voltage versus channel length, you might expect something like that. And as you guys know, because you did the homework, our model do something like this. And this actually does happen. It is, it is a real thing. Um, and it's labeled reverse short channel effect for obvious reasons. Now, the funny thing, and that's what I thought we were seeing with our models. Uh, it's only when you go to really short channel links that you actually see the traditional uh, short channel effect on threshold voltage. <coughs> But somebody told me that if you plot the extrapolated value of threshold voltage by hand, uh, then it does do something like this. It does kind of what you expect. And so the question is, why is the model internal threshold voltage models using different from what you would, you know, what extrapolated value? And I don't have a good answer for you guys. Uh, if some of you are have looked into this issue in detail and, and would like to, to shed some light on this, I, I would appreciate it. So either now or during office hours. Um, as far as the circuit design in, in this class goes, you know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change things a whole lot. Uh, it's just the inconsistency that bothers me. You would like to see consistency between model parameter and some kind of extrapolated threshold voltage. Either if you define a certain current, you know, some fraction of IDSS and say that's where VT occurs, or let's say linear region extrapolated VT. Um, the other, so basically I'll write this down for people coming in late. Uh, so in our model right now, there is no flicker noise coefficient, so it's zero by default. And so I'm going to make a new model release. that has the flicker coefficient uh, in it so that we can actually talk about flicker noise in, in the homework. Um, another quick announcement. Uh, I think by now most of you have probably have your simulations set up in you know, Cadence or 8Spice or whatever it may be. Uh, but in case you're still having some problems, uh, one of the students in this class was nice enough to put together a little one-sheet summary of, uh, of the procedure. So you can look through that and uh, and make sure you're all set up correctly. Okay. Questions or comments? All right. So let's uh, pick up where we left last lecture. Last lecture, we started to talk about thermal noise. In particular, thermal noise in resistors. And we made the observation that if you were to take a resistor and just observe, you know, hold it at some temperature T, and observe, let's say, the open circuit voltage on this resistor, that depending on the observation bandwidth, you would measure some kind of noisy waveform, which is completely random and unpredictable, right? And the variance of the voltage that you would measure would be proportional to so we'll call this Vn squared 4KTR times B, where B is the bandwidth of observation. In other words, you know, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take our resistor, 
hook it up to an ideal brick wall low pass filter of bandwidth B, and then we're going to actually absorb observe this waveform. Okay? And so this is the time domain observation. It basically we find if we plot several values, we find the amplitude distribution is a Gaussian with zero mean. And the variance is exactly this value that we've quoted here. What's really interesting about this result is that if you increase the bandwidth, the variance increases. And it does so without bound up to frequencies that we're actually capable of, of, of observing. Um, which would imply, you know, if you continue doing that as we talked about last lecture, it would imply infinite power, which is basically uh, not possible. Um, but we know that it does trail off at very, very high frequencies, several terahertz. The other interesting question you could ask is, well, you know, this is a random waveform. So, of course, I'm not going to know the exact waveform, but what are the properties of the waveform? So, you might ask, well, how is the energy in this waveform distributed with frequency, right? There's no reason uh, why it should be in any particular, right? It, th there's no reason to suspect right off the bat that it's white, right, that it's flat. It could, it could look like anything. And so what you do is, how do you, how do you find out experimentally that uh, it is white? So what you could do, you know, do a thought experiment. Of course, you could set something like this up. Now we're going to use a very sharp filter with bandwidth delta F and some center frequency F naught. And then we're going to go into a power meter. So what we're going to do is we're going to observe how much power uh, there is in some frequency delta F. And if we do that, if we do this time-consuming experiment, right, uh, then we would find that actually uh, the noise, you know, in reality, I've drawn it like this. This is what the measurement will look like. But theoretically, it's flat all the way out to terahertz where it drops off. And so this is why we say the noise is white because it kind of looks like white light. It has all components of frequencies in equal amounts. Okay? And so then if you come back and look at if this is the total power up to a bandwidth B, then the fractional power, if you look at the power spectrum, which I'll call S of R, it should be 4KTR delta F. And so this is sometimes called the spot noise because it's the noise in some small bandwidth delta F. Okay? Now, the, the key point about this noise is that it's a thermal noise. It has a thermal origin. And, you know, people worked out this, the theory of the noise at the turn of the century, um, previous century, not this one, obviously. And uh, basically, the theory and the measurements match very, very well. So very, you know, the origin of this noise is very well known, right? There's no doubt that this is thermal noise. And the fact that it is thermal noise means that if you lower temperature, the noise also drops, right, in linearly. And you can go in the lab and also uh, observe that. So now um, we're going to talk about a different kind of noise, which is called shot noise. Uh, And shot noise is uh, is observed. Uh, it's independent of temperature. That's the first important property. That means it's not of thermal origin. And this is where we might get into a little bit of controversy. Uh, we can talk about this a little bit later. But the the idea is kind of very generically that if you have some kind of potential barrier. And let's say you're injecting charge across this barrier. Let's say electrons are getting injected across this barrier. Uh, and the electrons are arriving kind of at random time. So we have random, to use some statistical terms, arrival times. <coughs> 
and basically random and independent, let's say. And this is key that it's independent. In other words, it, you know, I, if I'm watching how much charge is crossing this barrier, let's say I plot that as a function of time, let's say an electron arrives at time t1, and then an electron arrives at time t2, and then at time t3, and then at time t4, the key is that the inter-arrival time is complete random, right? There's no, um, basically the, these are completely independent. So the fact that an electron arrived at time t1 um, has basically no bearing on when the next electron is going to arrive. And uh, sometimes people model uh, standing at a bus stop uh, <laughs> in this way. They think, you know, if you see a bus now, there's no correlation when the next bus is going to come. Um, joking aside, though, um, if you take this model and take into account that this is the current, right? This gives rise to your current. And because the electron has a finite discrete amount of charge, the current is lumpy, right? The current comes in lumps. It's not a smooth function. So we could say that due to discreteness of charge, And due to this, int, you know, random arrival time, we get noisy current. And the noise variance, so let's just say I squared, the variance of this current is 2Q times I DC, where this is the DC current crossing that junction. Okay? So this is very interesting. Uh, because first of all, of course, you would expect Q to appear, right? Q is the basic electron or hole charge, the discrete charge packet, if you like. And it's proportional to the DC current, meaning that if there is no current, right, there should be no noise. And the more current there is, the more noise that we observe. And it has nothing to do with temperature, as, as we observe. So this kind of noise appears to be very different than um, thermal noise. Okay, questions up to here. The equation doesn't look right, right, because the the unit doesn't uh, fit. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So again, what we observe. Thank you for pointing that out. Is you know, so this is how much noise we observe in, let's say, a small bandwidth. So we do this experiment again. And again, what we do is we do the same experiment to find the spectrum. And we find that it's flat, or more commonly known as white. So just like <coughs> thermal noise, uh, the, the waveform is completely uncorrelated to itself at any given time. So it's completely independent from itself. And uh, that gives rise to our white noise. If you've taken a class in, in, uh, in random processes, you know that the spectrum is related to the autocorrelation function. So it's really a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, meaning that for even shot noise, autocorrelation function is a delta function. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, right away we can think of a system that looks a lot like this, right? What's that system? Any, any kind of junction, right? Like a PN junction or a diode. So diode is exactly like this. There's a barrier, and the probability that an electron will cross that barrier depends on its energy, which is pretty random, right? Given an electron arrives, it may have enough energy uh, may have more than enough energy. And so we would expect this model to apply. So in fact, the way we model <coughs> a diode is we have a noiseless diode, kind of a fictitious noiseless diode. And then in parallel with it, we put in this noise current source, 2Q ID delta F. Okay. So that seems uh, 
pretty reasonable. Um, the thing that, that bothers bothered me as a student and sometimes still bothers me now is the fact that you know this noise ari arises because of the discreteness of charge, right? So why doesn't the resistor have shot noise? Right? In the resistor, if I stand at a particular point and just observe the current going by, right? Well, first of all, there's electrons going in both directions. Um, but there is a net drift current in one direction, right? And that net drift current also has the property that it's discrete lump charge. So why is it that there's no shot noise in a resistor? Anybody have an answer to that? Hey, you want to use the mic? Thanks. The, the resistors, I think, do have shot noise. Why don't we observe it? Well, I think it's the relative, uh, the, 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 it's too smaller or something, but they do have shot noise. Depending on how they made resistors, it's more or less it's different, but they do have shot noise. Okay. So somebody claims that there is shot noise in resistors. Um, anybody want to refute that claim? All right. Well, I remember I, when I was a student, somebody showed me this little trick, and uh, somebody said, "Okay, shot noise is not real. It's just thermal noise." And this was the argument. The argument is that what's the incremental resistance of a diode, right? Incremental resistance of a diode is just the G diode, right? Which is the current in the diode divided by KT over Q, right? So now if I take, if I just assume that, of course, this is an incremental resistance, not a physical resistance, but let me just assume that the diode has thermal noise because of this resistor. So then I would say that the diode current would be 4KT times GD times delta F, which is 4KT QID over KT delta F. And you can see that KTs cancel out, and within a constant, you get shot noise. Right? So we start out with thermal noise. So we'll call this fake thermal noise because it's not really real thermal noise. And we ended up with shot noise. Okay? Uh, this actually happens a lot. That you can take the equations for thermal noise, and we'll see another example today with a MOSFET, and show that it kind of looks like the thermal noise is it shot noise is thermal noise well I'm not a noise expert but I can tell you that this is not right that the noise in a diode is not due to thermal noise it's due to um, shot noise and why is it that we see the similarity well there's something interesting going on I mean the the, the whole way that the diode itself works is a therm thermodynamic process right the energy of the carriers is a Boltzmann distribution and so there's thermodynamics going on in the diode to make the current possible, and that's why the current kind of looks like it has thermodynamics in it. But that does not mean that the diode has uh, thermal noise. And the way you can prove that to yourself, if you so happen to be so curious, is you can put constant current through a diode and hold it at some temperature, T1, measure its noise, right? So you observe the noise. And then you can change the temperature to T2. Now, if it's shot noise, I've held the current constant, noise shouldn't change. If it's thermal noise, the noise should change. And what you will observe is, in fact, that the noise does not change. So noise is independent of temperature. That means it's shot noise. Now, I, I have a friend who's a noise expert, so I sent him an email and I said, why isn't there shot noise in a resistor? And uh, he actually responded and sent me this long email. <laughs> so I'm not going to bring that email to class and try to convey his explanation. But the, the gist of his argument was that, indeed, there is shot noise in a resistor, just as you, you also said. But... Uh, you don't observe it for a macroscopic resistor because there's all sorts of averaging going on that, that basically it disappears. If you build a mesoscopic resistor, if you build a tiny nano resistor, you will observe shot noise. And people have built 
nanoresistors and observe shot noise going through them. One thing I can just give you a warning about is noise, it's funny, because it's kind of like number theory. You, you can get a, a grade school person to understand, it, you can get somebody like a five-year-old person to state a theorem in number theory that the best mathematicians can't prove, right, for maybe 200 years. And so this also has the same quality. You can ask very simple questions and it'll baffle me as well. So, um, and I'm not a noise expert. So just with that warning, um, we can move forward. What else did I want to say? Oh yeah, so the, the argument that the resistor noise does not have shot noise kind of comes back to this picture here. We said that the arrival has to be random and independent. Turns out in a resistor, when the charges are moving around, they change the internal fields, and they change the probability for other charges to actually end up crossing that particular point that you're looking at. I mean, there's also junctions in resistors, right? You, if you build a resistor, there's contact resistance, there's a little potential barrier. And so if you, if you go to that potential barrier and say, I should observe shot noise, then what happens is as, as an electron crosses that barrier, it changes the barrier height. And that means that you don't have this independent property. And that's the long explanation uh, shortened considerably for why you do not ha observe shot noise in real resistors. Okay. Questions or comments? All right. So uh, let's look at the slide. I think we've said everything that needs to be said. Uh, on the slide. Um, actually, I, I would say this is wrong. It's not zero mean. The mean is the DC current, right? So uh, it has, but it does definitely have Gaussian PDF. Uh, we talked about the power spectrum. It's white. Very important, proportional to current and independent of temperature. And then kind of a number to put in the back of your pocket is if you put a milliamp of current through a junction, and observe a megahertz of bandwidth, the noise, the RMS value, the root mean square, uh, would be 17 nanoamps. Okay. Now, yeah, so let's forget this thermal equilibrium thing. The, the, the argument, another way to, to look at a diode is a, a diode is actually not in thermal equilibrium, whereas a resistor is. Some more physics for you if you're interested. Okay, so how about a bipolar transistor? Well, here's a, a complete model for a bipolar transistor, and uh, you guys can probably see that, right? You can see that uh, it's the regular hybrid pi kind of model that we've been using a lot, and all we've done is we've added noise sources to it. So in particular, you'll notice that RB now has a noise, thermal noise associated with it, RE has thermal noise associated with it, and RC has thermal noise associated. That's because these are physical resistors. When you build a transistor, unfortunately, you have resistance and uh, in, in contacting the junction. Remember, in a transistor, the actual transistor is embedded at that base emitter collector junction, right? And uh, everything else is kind of structures to get at that vertical junctions, and those introduce resistance. Uh, in particular, if you guys were in 142, you know that RB plays a very important role in uh, determining how much noise you get out of a transistor. What about R pi and RO? What's the noise associated with R pi and RO? Anybody? I think probably half of you know the answer, right? <laughs> Just don't want to say. Yeah. They're not physical resistors, so there's no thermal noise associated with them? That's right. So R pi and R O are not physical resistors. They're, they're modeling resistors, and so they don't introduce noise. Uh, but there is IB and IC. And uh, if you look at those equations, you'll see that uh, at least one component of IB and IC is shot noise, just like we described for a diode. And that's also understandable because bipolar transistor has two junctions, and those junctions exhibit shot noise. Now, what gets complicated, though, is that 
you know, if an electron crosses, let's say it gets injected from the emitter into the base, that same electron may cross the uh, collector junction, right, base collector junction. So does that mean that there should be correlation between the collector and base currents? Um, I tried to look up the answer to this, and uh, there was like two lectures at some, you know, some university, you know, lecture notes on noise, very detailed calculations. At the end, there was no <laughs> actual real answer. It was like no conclusive answer. Uh, so what I'll tell you guys is for all practical purposes, just say that they're independent. Make your life easy. But, you know, just intuitively, you would expect some kind of partial correlation, right? Not all the, you know, there is some, depends on what happens in the base, right? In the base junction, you could re-randomize, and so then the arrival time at the collector is completely independent of when it was injected, right? Depending on, you know, the diffusion properties in the base. But make life easy, just assume they're independent, okay? So this is your, your small signal model for a bipolar transistor, including all the noise sources that are important. Um, you'll notice that it's kind of messy, right? We've got five or six different noise sources. Doing circuit analysis with five or six different sources is kind of a pain. Uh, one thing that comes to the aid is superposition. So you can take one source at a time. So if I want to find the total output noise coming out of a transistor, I would calculate the transfer function from each noise source to the output one out of one at a at, at a time. But that means I have to do five or six different calculations. So doing noise analysis does tend to be very tedious. And uh, that's why you really want to uh, make good use of a simulator. You know, this is something that a computer can do. Once you understand what's at stake, you can let the computer do all the, the dirty work for you. All right, so how about a FET? Again, a FET is uh, another controversial device. Um, so let, let's talk about it for a little bit over here. So if I want to know the, what the noise is in a FET, you know, you basically, let's, first of all, let's start out somewhere nice, so nice and easy. Let's start out in the triode region, okay? The triode region, and let's say, you know, that means we're in strong inversion. That means there's a nice channel uh, connecting the source and drain regions, right? And that means that this is really just a resistor, right? It's a, it's a voltage-controlled resistor. So what's the resistance of this channel? So in other words, what's GDS? Well, GDS is, if you like, let's just say VDS over IDS, right? We just treat it like a resistor, okay? Um, if I treat it like a resistor, IDS is mu C ox W over L. Again, let's use simple theory. VGS minus VT times VDS minus VDS squared over 2. And let's say VDS is small, so I'll just neglect this term here. That means, let me just call this capital GDS. That means the VDS cancels out, and I have that the, this should be R, uh, the RDS of this device is basically mu C ox W over L VGS minus VT. So this is a voltage controlled resistor. And Therefore, if we talk about the noise of this resistor, we would expect that the noise should just be, because this is the re physical resistance, right? The noise should just be 4KT uh, times this resistance. So le actually, let me represent it as a current noise. Let's call this ID squared. Then I would expect ID squared to be 4KT GDS times delta F. And why do I put little GDS? Well, that's because it's a nonlinear resistor, right? If I plot ID versus VDS, 
looks something like that, right? It bends over and eventually it flattens out. And that's, of course, the classical limit between uh, saturation and, and triode region. And so because noise is a small signal process, at any given operating point, the effective resistance of this structure is the slope, right? And the slope is derivative of IDS with respect to VDS at some VDS zero. And in fact, if you calculate that slope, it's nothing but VGS minus VT minus VDS. Sorry, ran out of room there. And we know exactly at saturation, right, this term goes to zero, and that means the slope has gone to zero. And so then you go in the lab and you do a measurement, and in fact, you find that this equation is right. This is the noise. Great. So what you found is that in a triode region FET, and I'll emphasize strong inversion, Basically, it's the thermal noise of the channel. Okay. So the channel is a resistive material. It has thermal noise. Great. Uh, what about the junctions, right? You might come back here and you say, well, you know, you do have some junctions here. So shouldn't they have some shot noise? Well, if this is strongly inverted, right, there's practically no barrier for an electron to go from this n plus region into the channel. So we can really think of this whole thing as an equipotential region. Okay. But we do have LDD, right? That's kind of like uh, by default. So we do have a little bit of barrier. Yeah, you, you can make this picture more complicated. And we'll do that a little bit when we talk about uh, weak inversion. So we'll come back to this issue. But the, the simplifying assumption here is in strong inversion, it's just thermal noise. We're going to just stay with that. Okay. What happens in saturation? So in saturation, again, we like to draw this nice cartoon intuitive picture. We draw a picture like this, where the level of inversion is decreasing as we go towards the drain side, right? And this is the pinch-off point. And so what we really have is we have a very strongly inverted, inverted source region, but a weakly inverted drain region. This resistor really didn't go anywhere. It's still there. So we still have this resistive channel. And then we have some kind of complicated two-dimensional you know, system here where carriers are injected across this depletion region, right? Uh, we call it depletion region because it's weakly inverted. There's practically no inversion charge. And so things are kind of complicated over here. But things over here are very simple. So what you might think is that that thermal noise that I had is not going to go away. It's going to stay there. And uh, it's basically going to, all the thermal noise generated by this region is somehow going to basically make its way to the output. Um, you could do this calculation very exactly, very carefully. And it's done in Civitas. I encourage you to look at it. Uh, in Civitas, what you do is you break up your transistor into tiny little sections. Particularly, you take one little section and assume that the potential across this region has a jump discontinuity due to the noise. In other words, I inject, uh, instead of injecting a true random variable, I inject, let's say, just a little discontinuity. I assume quasi-statics. So at a given instant of time, I, I say that if everything were noiseless except for this tiny little section, then the potential, surface potential across here, would have a little jump discontinuity. And in fact, so then I calculate what the effect is of that jump discontinuity on the output current. And then I integrate over all sections, right? And at the end of the day, I end up with a nice expression that looks like this. So ID squared 
is 4kt mu over alt squared q inversion delta f. So q inversion is the total amount of inversion charge here. And uh, <clears throat> again, this is thermal noise, so it has the 4kt. And so really, this is the, the way you do this calculation is complicated. Uh, it's a couple pages of setup in, in Civitas. But the, the result is nice and clean. And in fact, um, this is the way SPICE calculates the thermal noise in a FET. It uses the equation very similar to this. Now, you might not like this equation, right? Because you probably don't think in terms of how much inversion charge there is in, in a transistor. But if you use a simple model, let's use our square law model. then the Q inversion associated with basically the device is amount of inversion charge, right? It's two-thirds times VGS minus VT times C ox. So I substitute here ID squared 4KT mu over L squared. This times W times L, right, to get the total amount of charge times two-thirds VGS minus VT times C ox times W times L. Okay, And so 1L cancels out here, and I get 4KT mu W over L C ox two-thirds VGS minus VT. Okay, And does anybody recognize, let me move the two-thirds over here, Anybody recognize this expression? It's a GM of the device, right? And so then we have this nice result that the noise looks like it's coming from a conductor of value GM. And somehow, because of these distributed effects, it's actually there's a scaling factor here, 2 thirds. And in fact, most people would write this as gamma times GM, where gamma is two-thirds for a long channel transistor, right, where this theory applies. And then you just assume for a short channel transistor, it's not going to be two-thirds. I'll determine that through some measurements. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, let me just give you some intuition for where this result comes from. This result is actually not that different from the triode region analysis that we just did. Because in, so if, if I look at the incremental resistance of this region, and let's call that GDS, it turns out that you know it's not hard to prove that this is basically proportional to the GM of the device. So the resistance of this region, uh, conductance of this region, is actually proportional to the GM of the device. Uh, the way you could see that is if you take two transistors, one of them in triode region, and calculate GDS0. So this is the GDS of this triode region device when you actually bias it with zero value of VDS. you find that it's actually equal to the GM of another device that's in saturation. And kind of intuitively, you can see that this resistance of this channel, given that they're biased up with the same value of VGST, VGS here, VGS here. So the idea is that the resistance of the internal channel is kind of the same as that device biased in triode region, right? changes a little bit, but to first order, the resistance should be the same. And that's why this expression for the noise is proportional 4kT times the conductance times some distributed factor. And that conductance, GDS0, is proportional to the GM of the device. Okay. So that's the intuitive argument for where this equation comes from. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about controversy. So, so people accepted that 
a MOSFET device can be modeled as a noiseless transistor with some drain noise that looks like this and it has basically at least one component that we talked about that's the thermal noise and there's another component which is the flicker noise okay. flicker noise is actually a thir another controversy and people were happy they said okay you have a transistor this is more or less the noise okay again now you can turn this around on me and say why is there no shot noise in the device right if you're in a saturation region now you do have a junction um, on the drain side so why don't you observe shot noise in a MOSFET device I'll give you my answer my answer is I don't know <laughs> um, if you experimentally observe the noise it's more or less this thermal noise source plus flicker noise which we'll talk about but here's the controversy so this is for what we derived here is for a long channel device gamma is equal to two-thirds and indeed you go out and you measure a long channel device let's say 10 micron or 20 micron whatever and you will get two-thirds Then you start decreasing the channel length and what you observe is that gamma keeps increasing and so very early on in, in the, the days of doing CMOS low noise circuits some people observe that for short channel devices at that time it was probably a quarter micron or something gamma was very large in fact people were reporting that gamma is basically large for short channel devices put a question mark there because this was kind of weird and also it was very very highly bias dependent and the measurements were very difficult to do so you know there was lots of noise and noise in the noise measurement so it was, you know you didn't really know what you were measuring so people were kind of throwing up red flags and saying what's going on in these short channel devices is the noise really large and by large I mean I, I, I think I've seen a paper where someone reported gamma was eight you know, that's huge right so I'll give you the long short story the short story is that once people did the measurements properly and used the proper expressions it turned out that gamma wasn't so bad gamma for a short channel device you know, it depends on bias and, and things like that but it's probably about two on the order of two so we're not talking like huge so it does go get larger and so kind of a rule of thumb that you guys can use is that gamma should be about two if you simulate this in BSIM-3, BSIM-3 will not give you a gamma equal 2. BSIM-3 doesn't have noise for th short channel devices and so it'll continue assuming an expression that ends up giving you two-thirds. So keep that in mind. Um, BSIM-4 does have a, a thermal noise model that will give you the correct value of noise as you go to short channel devices. The other question is why is it that people were observing such strong bias dependencies in gamma. In other words, gamma was a function of VGST. And the reason for that was probably, you know, you can only conjecture, GM has a huge bias dependency, right? Because mobility has a huge bias dependency. And so for these long channel devices, short channel devices, the mobility was dropping because of short channel effects. And the mobility was dropping because the vertical fields and the lateral fields were so large that they were putting you in velocity saturation and you know, so really if you go back if you look at the, 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 the way that people will write the noise current down instead of writing it as 4kt gamma times gm they'll write it as gds0 and stop there meaning that the noise the thermal noise is the really due to the channel noise in triad region because in triad region there are no large fields there's no large right drain to source field and so you won't get into velocity saturation and if you want to you know so this is kind of it's nice because now if you write it like this gamma is going to only be two the bad thing is though that you know we don't really think of GDS zero we, we just would like to write down GM right <laughs> instead of GDS zero
And indeed, we saw that for a device in long channel, the GM is actually equal to GDS0. So the GM of a transistor is equal to GDS0 of a transistor in triode region with the same value of VGS. So to, to fix this problem, people write this as 4KT gamma over alpha times GM, where this coefficient alpha captures the difference between GM and GDS0 for a real device, for a short channel device. And the, real, the reason that GM starts to drop is because of the short channel effects. Okay. Question? Uh, yeah, a question uh, related to the bias dependency of the noise. So the, the formula still holds. Is it, I mean, like a GM uh, varies, but the formula in, uh, per se still holds, right? Yeah, if you want, the, the best formula to go with is this one here. And if you use this formula and assume that gamma varies a little bit, but not much, you'll get good results. If you use this formula without alpha, you'll get bad results because GM will have a strong bias dependence. But if you include alpha, which is bias dependent, then everything kind of works out again. But the measured noise, is, is it bias dependent or not? The measured noise is bias dependent, yeah. And that's because of alpha variation, right? So if you look at this equation here, the thermal noise, I should say that, uh, yes, it is bias dependent. And so if you come back to this equation, I guess the controversy is over gamma. Is gamma bias dependent? And the answer is that it's very weakly bias dependent if you use this equation. Okay. All right, so that's the thermal noise of a, uh, a FET. And so I think we've talked about this slide completely. Uh, we talked about this slide. Talked about this. Okay, so let's talk about weak inversion. So again, with weak inversion, we can get into trouble. Because in weak inversion, the device is completely different than strong inversion. So let, let's look at the device in weak inversion. OK, so in weak inversion, what we have is, for all practical purposes, the amount of inversion charge here is very low, right? And so what we have is we have an equal potential. So the surface potential is roughly constant and does not vary appreciably across here. And there's no channel. And the way that current flow is occurring is that we're basically injecting carriers from this junction into this channel, into this so-called, looks like a bipolar transistor, to this base region. And then we're collecting them across this junction at the collector. And so definitely we would expect that there's two barriers here. Looks just like a bipolar transistor. So definitely it looks like we should observe shot noise uh, in, this, in this device. Okay. So in other words, for a FET operating in weak conversion, we would expect this to be 2Q IDS, this weak conversion, times delta F. So now let's look at uh, what you get if you actually use some of the equations that, that, that are derived for a weak conversion region. What if you take the expression, this expression here, and just plug in how much charge you have in weak conversion. So that would be, you know, the amount of charge you have is the charge you have at the source plus the charge you have at the drain divided by 2 in weak conversion. Why is that? Let's see who, who's awake. Anybody? In weak conversion, I'm going to claim that the total amount of charge in the channel is its a small number, right? Because we're not, it's very weakly inverted. But the claim is it's just the charge at the source plus the drain divided by 2. Anybody have a good answer for that? OK, it doesn't matter if you don't know. I mean, this is basically, it doesn't matter for this course. But 
if you think of this as a bipolar device, right, the current is due to diffusion. That means the current is constant, and if it's due to diffusion, it just depends on the slope, right? If the current's constant, that means the slope is constant, it's triangular profile, and so this is basically the area of that triangle. Okay, so anyhow, forget that. Plug in some expressions that you have for the charge and weak conversion, and you come out with an equation that looks like this at the bottom. It looks like you have shot noise multiplied by this factor here. And the question is, again, we, we ran into some trouble because that equation that we derived earlier was based on thermal noise. We assumed that the device had thermal noise, and then we derived this equation in weak conversion, and we got shot noise, right? <laughs> So which is correct? Is it this equation up here or this equation down here? Well, again, this is another controversial thing. Uh, the noise is definitely shot noise. It's not thermal noise. So basically, this equation is right. But for all practical purposes, for you know, VDS is usually large, right, when we're in weak conversion. And this term here, it's lar certainly larger than 25 millivolts. And so for all practical purposes, you get the same answer. So if you build a model that always uses QI, you get almost the right answer, even as you go into weak conversion, which is kind of convenient. It makes the modeling easier. But again, it makes you kind of roll in bed at night when you're thinking of this diode and why is it that thermal noise and shot noise are the same. It's troubling. OK. so. So we've talked about the thermal noise in the devices. Um, there's also gate-induced noise that we, we won't talk about in this class. But if you took 142 or if you take it in the future, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll remember it. The idea is that some of this thermal noise in the channel leaks into the gate and presents a gate current noise. And uh, that's important for, for designing, let's say, low noise amplifiers. Um, it's also very important at high frequencies. So that's why in this class, for designing baseband circuits, even up to a few hundred megahertz, um, it's not going to really come into play. It's really when you get into the gigahertz frequencies where it becomes important. Something else that, uh, something to watch out for certainly is gate current leakage. As we build, you know, thinner and thinner oxide devices, the tunneling current increases. Again, tunneling current has the recipe for shot noise, right? There's a barrier. If you have enough energy, you tunnel through it. Uh, therefore, actually, even if you don't have enough energy, you can still tunnel through, right, with some probability. Um, so that the gate current leakage should give rise to shot noise, and it does. For most processes that we use in analog circuits, the, the gate leakage is so low that the shot noise is negligible. But you know, if you go and start working with 65 and 45, you should really re-examine those assumptions and see if you can neglect it. Just like a bipolar transistor, of course, RO does not contribute noise because it's a modeling resistor, not a physical resistor. And finally, all the extrinsic resistances in the device contribute noise. Okay, so again, here is the model. Uh, you can see that the main source of noise we've identified here is this drain thermal noise. All these junctions, uh, all these resistive regions in these junctions, source drain region, have resistance. And so there's thermal noise associated with them. And then the gate material is, is polysilicon. Even silicided, it has resistance. And so it contributes noise. And uh, again, this is a topic we discussed extensively in 142. The way it contributes noise is also distributed. So in fact, you don't see the total resistance. You see some fraction of the resistance, from one third to one twelfth of the actual resistance of the polymaterial. Okay, questions up to here. All right. Well, we we kind of neglected a very important noise in MOSFET devices, and that's flicker noise or one over F noise. Now, flicker noise is very different from thermal noise and shot noise. The reason is that for thermal noise and shot noise, people worked out the theory a long time ago, right? 
almost 100 years ago, people had the theory to explain the origin of thermal noise and shot noise in a device. Flicker noise, though, to this day, uh, is controversial. What is the origin of flicker noise? And there's really two good models out there that people use. Uh, we won't talk about them in this class, but what we should know as circuit designers about flicker noise is that, one, it's very process dependent. So if you take the same transistor from company A and company B, same W over L, same bias condition, and you measure the flicker noise, they're not going to be the same. And this is not due to variations from device to device. So you measure a thousand devices and find the mean flicker noise in technology A, or let's say company A, and the mean flicker noise in company B. They're different. And they can be a, a very different, factor of two, three, even a factor of 10. So flicker noise is very dependent on the process. And it depends a lot on the interface between the oxide and the silicon. Um, in, in one of the models, it has to do the flicker. The origin of flicker noise is due to traps in the oxide and at the interface. And that the way that the model works, the idea is that if you're an inversion carrier, there's a probability that you'll get trapped. You'll fall into one of these traps at the oxide interface. And the amount of time you spend in that trap is basically a random variable. And the time constant is actually quite slow. So you might spend a nanosecond there. You might spend a second there. And that process of capturing and releasing carriers from the inversion layer, if you do the math, you get 1 over F noise. In other words, the spectrum The spectrum of flicker noise, if I plot it on a log scale, has slope basically minus 1, 1 over f. And if you actually measure a real device, though, you find that it's not quite 1 over f. You know, there's close to 1, but C is, you know, roughly 1, but it can actually be a little bit different from 1. So one, one model for, for this flicker noise looks like this. That if you work out the theory, it turns out that the flicker noise is proportional to DC current through the device. It's proportional to some constant, which is, you know, this fudge factor. It's process dependent proportional to 1 over L squared and proportional to C ox. Okay. Now this is just one of the models out there. So if you want to be a really safe person and you say, well, I don't really believe this model, you just lump this whole thing and call this whole thing K prime F. And if you look in a lot of textbooks, that's what they do. They don't really put their money on one model or the other. So something interesting happened with, uh, with uh, some research here at Berkeley. At some point, uh, some researchers here at Berkeley decided that actually both theories were right and they were both present in, in real transistors. Um, sometimes it showed one theory showed itself more, sometimes the other did, depending on the conditions. So the, the model in BSIM 3 is kind of a universal flicker noise model. It has both types in it and you can kind of select which one you want to dominate or not depending on the device. In fact, it's very well believed that the flicker noise of the NMOS is due to one process, and the flicker noise of the PMOS is due to another process. OK, in any case, something that you should take away from this slide is the flicker noise for NMOS and PMOS can be dramatically different. Uh, here you see that it's almost a factor of 10 better, more than a factor of 10 better, for these numbers that, that I've quoted here. and. Uh, Anybody have a, a guess for why the flicker noise is better in a PMOS device? I'm sure some of you know. No guesses? Yes. Surface conduction versus that's right. So you didn't have to guess. You knew the answer. So uh, most PMOS devices are buried channel devices. So the actual conduction takes place below the surface. And that means you're less susceptible to interface traps. And that's why the PMOS device has much better flicker noise 
So if you are building circuits that are very sensitive to flicker noise, um, watch out. This is, you know, PMOS device may give you a lot of benefits. Don't, don't neglect that option. Another interesting thing about flicker noise is it's also proportional to current, right? And um, the fact that it goes like 1 over F is kind of funny because this implies that as you go to lower and lower frequencies, the noise gets higher and higher and it kind of blows up, right? And so the question is, is that real, right? Yeah, it's real. Um, flicker noise doesn't appear just at uh, just for transistors, it's actually kind of a universal phenomenon. It's observed in a lot of different fields. The fact that it blows up as you go to zero frequency shouldn't bother you because what does that correspond to? Right, that's right, infinite time. So you have to go back to before the creation of the universe, right, to observe flicker noise at those low frequencies. So if you're designing a circuit, you know, how long is that circuit going to run, right? If it runs on batteries, it may run a couple days and then gets turned off. If it's plugged in the wall, maybe if you're lucky, it's alive 10 years, right? So the, t the fr flicker noise you need to consider, you should integrate over 1 over 10 years. That would be the frequency, the starting point in the frequency. In other words, what I'm going to do is to calculate the total flicker noise. I'm going to integrate from some low frequency up to some high frequency, right? This is my bandwidth. This is how long, this is proportion, 1 over how long the circuit has been on. And let's just plug in this expression. Okay, so this is just simple integral of log, definition of the log function, if you like. So I get natural log of f high divided by f low. Okay. And so now you see that this lower time constant or the lower frequency, because I have a log function, doesn't play a huge role in the noise. In other words, let me go down to 1 hertz. Okay. So if I plug in these numbers for, let's say, again, in this slide, just a simple example, I have 10 microamps, L is 1 micron, C aux is 5.3 femtofarads per micron squared. And let me say F high is 1 megahertz. Okay? And let me plug in F low of 1 hertz. That works out to be a current of 722 picoamps RMS noise. Okay? Well, now let's say, blah, let's make F low 1 over a year assume the current circuit is running for a year and I integrate basically that noise oh, from 1 over a year all the way out to 1 megahertz. This implies 1082 picoamps RMS. So even though you know, we went from one second to a year, the, you know, the increase in current is very small, right? So really, this is not a big deal. It doesn't really play a significant role. This lower limit on this integral practically doesn't mean anything, right? Because of the fact that it's so small. Now, what's uh, one thing I should also say right here before we leave this slide is that look, notice that if you believe this theory, 1 over f noise is proportional to 1 over L squared. That means that the longer the channel length, the lower the noise. And in fact, if you measure devices, it might not be proportional to L squared or L minus 2, but it does depend on L. And in general, if you measure real devices, you find that longer channel lengths do indeed have better flicker noise. So if you're designing circuits and flicker noise is important, this is one way to combat flicker noise, simply use longer channel lengths. Does this apply for N and BMOS in the same way? Yes. Yeah. Uh, question. Is there uh, a temperature dependency here? It's a good question. Uh, I'll give you my answer. No, I don't know. I don't know. Um, again, this, you know, KF is a very complicated little beast. So we've swept a lot of stuff under the rug. I don't know if there's what kind of temperature. 
Certainly there is temperature dependence. I don't know what the physics is, though. Yeah. Okay, an important concept for flicker noise is the corner frequency. And the idea is that if I look at the, if I just take my device, bias it up, and just observe this noise current, if I plot the spectrum, it looks something like this, right? Where this is, so this is on a log scale. This is the flicker noise, of course. And this is the thermal noise. So the flicker noise corner frequency, let's call this FC, is the point where the flicker noise is equal to the thermal noise. Now, why is that interesting? Because if my circuit operates always above the corner frequency, I don't care about flicker noise, right? If I op have to operate below the corner frequency, then I do care about flicker noise. And if I'm comparing one process to another, one way to compare them is by the corner frequency. If process A has a corner frequency of 1 megahertz, and process B has a corner frequency of 10 megahertz, certainly I like the process with 1 megahertz corner frequency because it has substantially lower flicker noise. Okay, so if anybody's ever trying to sell you a process, ask them, what's your flicker noise corner frequency, right? It's a good number to know. So if we come back to this slide here, what we do to find the flicker noise corner frequency, all we do is we equate the flicker noise to the thermal noise and do a little bit of algebra and solve, and we have this equation which says the flicker noise corner frequency is proportional to KF. That's the process dependence. It's also proportional to uh, 1 over C ox, and it's directly proportional to V star, right? V star is our kind of like our VD sat. So if we bias the device with a higher value of V star, we get a higher corner frequency. And again, the important point is this L dependence. You can see here for our NMOS device on the previous page, as we go from, so this is a 0.35 micron device, corner frequency is a couple hundred kilohertz. If you now change it to one micron device, you cut that down to 24 kilohertz. Okay, so you have some control on that. And here are some SPICE simulations just showing you that uh, indeed the SPICE model works as you change the channel length. So this is a device 100 over 1 and 1000 over 10 so they have the same W over L, but obviously the 10 micron device we would expect to have lower flicker noise, and you see that. That's the pink curve here, and this is the blue curve. This is a 50 over 2 device, falls somewhere in between. And you can see that this device has substantially lower thermal noise. Let me make one comment, which is, uh, I think, a very common mistake that uh, I, even I've made, so I think it's worthwhile to point this out. Don't be fooled by this log plot, right? What's really misleading about a log plot? It overemphasizes the lower frequencies. That's right. So it really, it, the, the nice thing about a log plot is it lets you take a large frequency range and just compress it and, show, and be, be able to see it on a small graph like this, right? So on this log scale, it looks like this flicker noise is really important, right? It's like, wow, look at all that flicker noise. And then this is our thermal noise. But if you take an integral from here to 1 gigahertz, how much is this part going to contribute? Nil, right? Because, right, this, the area, basically the length from here to here is not equal to the length from here to here, right? And that's what is confusing about a log plot. So certainly never do integrations on a log scale. I've seen people actually, you know, count up the area you see on a log scale, and you get really bad answers, you know, gross answers, which totally emphasize that flicker noise is important. Flicker noise is important, but it's not that important, right? Okay. And we saw that when we did this calculation here, that the integral of flicker noise is a log function, right? So 
Okay, so this is a summary of, now that we've kind of reviewed all the noise models that are out there, uh, this is a summary of how you do noise analysis, okay? And let's say you want to find the total output noise of an amplifier, right? So I, I just walk through it here. This is easy enough. Draw the small signal model. Put in all your noise sources, right? So a bipolar device has six noise sources. FET, you might put in two or three different noise sources. And then you use superposition. You set all the inputs equal to zero, except the particular noise source that you care about. And then you calculate the transfer function from that noise source to the output. Call that H of S, right? It's frequency dependent. Keep doing this for all noise sources in your circuit and sum them up. So this is the, out, the total output noise is the sum of all the noise sources currents or voltages times their transfer function, magnitude squared. Where does the magnitude squared come from? That comes from a very simple calculation. If you do a, uh, a calculation on what's the variance of the output and write a couple lines of algebra, do some linear analysis, you find that for noise signals, the variance works out to be the magnitude squared. So when you do noise calculations, be careful. It's the magnitude squared of the transfer function, and that's it. So it's really just a bunch of linear analysis that you've been able to do since your probably your sophomore year of, of, of undergrad. But it's very tedious, right? If you've ever done these calculations, you can simple calculation turns into 15 pages. You know, I want to calculate the output noise of a common source amplifier. If you do it exactly with all the noise sources, it's three or four pages long, right? Very ugly. So the, the point is that, first of all, if you do this a few times, it's painful, but you gain intuition for what's important, what's not important, and you learn to drop things that are not important. That's the one, first thing you learn to do. The second thing you learn to do is you kind of learn the transfer functions by heart. You kind of realize, well, yeah, I know in this scenario, this is the transfer function. Well, in this scenario, classic example is degeneration on a common source device. You remember what that degeneration does to the noise. And so then you don't repeat this calculation over and over again. So the nice thing is that if you go through some pain for one or two homework assignments, you will gain a lot of intuition and you'll be able to do the calculations much faster, which will come in handy on an exam. Uh, in real life, of course, most of the time you're going to use a simulator, right? You're going to let the simulator do all the dirty work for you. But what you want to do is verify that the dominant noise source that you picked out by hand is in fact the dominant noise source that the simulator is picking up. So you want to, don't want to completely abandon hand calculations. What you want to do is you want to look at an amplifier and say, I think that the thermal noise of M5 is the dominant noise. Let me do one calculation to see what the output noise is. Then you run SPICE, and SPICE says that total noise is 20% higher than the noise of M5. That's great. You were right. M5 was a dominant noise source. And then when you do your design, you can focus on no lowering the noise by zeroing in on M5. Now, if you don't do that at the start, you run SPICE, you don't really know where the noise is coming from, right? Actually, no, spice is nice. There's a noise summary. <laughs> so you can actually summarize what the noise contribution is from each source, and you can focus on the noise source that's important. All right, I won't go through this example in detail. You guys can look at the slides. This is, let's say, a, a transimpedance amplifier where you're taking a current with some source resistance, and you're amplifying it with this common source amplifier. And the question is, how much total output noise do you get? Okay. And uh, here's SPICE. This is the output noise, uh, output voltage noise versus frequency. And this is the different contributions. So for instance, this is the load resistor contribution to the total noise. Uh, you can see that the bandwidth, even though the noise of the resistor is flat, because there's filtering in the circuit, right? There's this load capacitance here that this time constant is really the time constant for the transfer function of the load resistance to the output. Um, this is the source resistance. You can see the source resistance contributes much more noise, partly because it gets gained up by the gain of the amplifier. And you can see the frequency response is a lot lower 
because the time constant associated with the input is a lot lower, partly due to Miller effect and, and the higher source resistance. And then finally, this pink curve is the transistor contribution. So the transistor drain current noise, thermal noise, is flat. It drops off just like the load does at this frequency here. And then at this low frequency of around a megahertz, the flicker noise kicks in, and we get a flicker noise contribution. So the total noise starts out below 100 hertz. It's all flicker noise. And then the source dominates, right? And then the transistor dominates. And so you can see that in this design, the source is really the dominant source of noise, which is a good thing, right? Uh, your, your, your actual amplifier is not adding that much noise to the overall noise budget. OK, so the next topic uh, we're going to talk about is uh, equivalent input noise generators. and. Um, Again, this is something I covered pretty extensively in 142, so I'll go a little bit faster here. If you find that the presentation is too fast, I encourage you to go through 142 notes and uh, and follow those. Okay. So certainly I'm not going to do this in four minutes, but uh, <laughs> it will be faster. So this is the idea. The idea is that I have this complicated, noisy two port, and it might have ten different noise generators in it, and I'm going to use this a lot, right? Either I'm going to give this to a customer who's going to use it, or I'm going to use this over and over again, right? Let's say this is a common source amplifier. Yeah, I'm going to use a common source amplifier all the time. So instead of working with five or six different noise sources, what I'd like to do is represent it in the following way, where I have a noiseless two port and fictitious noise sources which completely characterize the noise of my system. So the first question is, can you do this? Is it possible to take all the noise sources out and put them out in front like this? The answer is yes, you can do it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be having this lecture. And uh, you can prove it. I'm not going to prove it to you in this class. There is one complication in that because this noise source is related to all the noise sources in here, and this noise source is also related to all the noise sources in here, that means these two noise sources are correlated. And that makes things a little bit more complicated, but we can certainly deal with correlation. Um, nice thing is when things are uncorrelated, when they're completely independent, we just sum variances, right? Now that they're correlated, we have to take the correlation into account. How do we find these equivalent noise generators? Well, first of all, this representation is not unique. In fact, I can turns out that as long as you have two correlated noise sources, I could put two current sources in parallel, like this. I can move everything to the output. There's nothing special about the input, right? I can represent things at the input like this. I could have two voltage sources at the input and the output. And so, just want to emphasize, there's nothing special about this representation. Uh, the reason we like this representation on the slide is that uh, Well, let's just, uh, let, OK, there we go. So the, the reason we like this representation is that it puts everything at the input. And when we put things at the input, we can compare it to the source, because the source is at the input. And the whole key of designing a low noise system is to minimize how much noise you add to your signal compared to what's already there. Now, the noise that comes in is determined by the source resistance. So if the noise that I add to the system is comparable, let's say, 10 times a lot larger than the noise that's already in the source, I've done a terrible job. I've increased the noise in my system by 10x. On the other hand, on the other extreme, if I can make sure the noise that I'm adding is small compared to the noise that's already there, I've done a good job. Okay, And so this is why we like to bring things to the input. So very quickly, how do we calculate these noise sources? Well, the way to calculate this is we short the input. And on the noisy two port, we calculate the total output noise, right? What happens if I do that with my noiseless two port? Well, if I short the input, you can see here that this current source 
it's shorted out. So all the noise in the current source just flows, circulates at the input, and has no impact on the output noise. So only the voltage noise contributes noise to the output. So what I can do is I can observe the total output noise here and here and just equate them. And when I do that, I, I find that I find an equation for Vn squared, right? I do the same thing over here. I shouldn't short the input. I should keep the open. Okay, sorry. Uh, I just repeated this twice. Um, if I keep the input open here and here, you can see that this voltage source is now dangling. It's, it's ineffective. It doesn't do anything. And the current now will flow completely into my two port. And if I do, do the same thing, I equate the noises, I'll find the equivalent input noise generator, current generator. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll pick it up from here next Thursday. No lecture next Tuesday.